Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Pierre de Montesquieu. I'm the editor of a website called Our Choices, where you can find uh, video interviews of artists. And one interview of Walton, too. Um, this evening, we're going to talk about this exhibition, uh, a very rare sight. And Walton in Paris is also a very rare sight because the last time you, you were in public, it was seven years ago. And we have a tight schedule, but we'll leave some room for some questions at the end of the talk, if you will, to ask anything. So, um, we're going to try to go a little bit beyond the, the wow effect of the size and the skills and to unfold a few layers uh, behind the, the work that makes it uh, really contemporary, uh, more than it seems. And maybe we could start where uh, everything began and your upbringing. Uh, you were born in Larchmont with no contact with nature, but your family had some contact yeah. with nature. So we, I mean, I grew up in a suburban setting in America. A lot of like sort of go uh, golf course kind of thing and uh, shopping malls, you know, and, and, and nice suburbs. Uh, so the idea of a good, um, education was important to my parents. And um, so <laughs> it was uh, like a lot of American kids you in the suburbs, you live in your imagination. You're, you're trying to get out of there. The idea is that you definitely want to get out of there. And my escape was to find whatever patch of woods I could find or a little piece of, of forest or whatever. And then we went on fishing trips. The, my father was an avid fisherman. So we'd go to Canada, uh, New Hampshire, and down to Virginia where there was uh, relatives who had a lot of land. So there was hunting and fishing that I was in, uh, introduced to. My family was quite old in America. They w had plantation houses in the, in the 18th and 19th century in, in places like uh, Nashville, which is, you know, before it was Nashville, and, and northern Georgia. It, family dates back to the 18th century in, in, in America. So. Uh, this sort of idea of, of a darker American history and also a hunger for nature and connection with that was part of how I grew up, yeah. yeah. And one of the f your favorite places in New York was the Museum of Natural History. Yeah, go to the Museum of Natural History in New York was like uh, heaven. And uh, I realized quite early on, I would draw there even when I was a little kid um, from the dioramas. They would allow me extra time, you know. and. Um, uh, those dioramas are works of art of, on the highest possible level. They're incredible. Uh, the background paintings were done by very great landscape artists, and the taxidermy was not uh, primitive. It wasn't, these animals aren't stuffed like a piece of furniture. They actually would create a sculpture, a very beautiful uh, sculpture of the animal, and work the skin over that. So all the blood vessels and veins and everything and muscles are correct. And so that, it's a very different type of taxidermy than what was practiced before the Museum of Natural History was, was done. Um, so it, it, I'm not really a great fan of taxidermy in general when it is awkward and, and rather hideous and kitsch. But the stuff in the Museum of Natural History isn't like that at all. It's, it's more like their fantastic narrative uh, works of art. And that's when you started to dig a little bit further with Carl Ackley or yeah. Charles Knight, for example? Yeah. I mean, so the idea is I learned who these artists were that made these dioramas. And there were sort of scientists slash, scientists slash artists. They, they were somewhere, they weren't really part of the art world. Um, so they might uh, reconstruct a dinosaur or something, you know, um, have a knowledge of uh, comparative anatomy, you know. And I admired these uh, people more than m m most of the contemporary artists I learned about. You, and, but, I, uh, and th but that was my childhood. And then I went off to art school, Rhode Island School of Design. And, um, and I rather buried that part of my interest because it didn't uh, fit in with what was going on, you know. I felt uh, awkward wanting to do narrative pictures of animals in, in the 70s at an art school when, you know, Robert Smithson and all of this was happening. It seemed like a very, um, like I was a reactionary or an or a, or a anachronistic uh, 
knucklehead or something. There wasn't any idea that that, that could be smart. That seemed really uh, absurd, you know? So then I gravitated towards more pop culture things, you know, like uh, 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 film animation. And comic books also. Comic books. Frank Zapparetta and yeah, like Crumb. Robert Crumb, yeah, exactly. R. Crumb or, or, or uh, 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 the King Kong, the original 1932 King Kong uh, with, with the sort of stop motion animation. So the interests were going and then it took me a minute after being at art school to realize that, and it was the punk era that I was at art school, so then the idea of rebelling seemed very important, and then I realized, oh, if my teachers are telling me that painting is dead, this is the real rebellion is to make something like this. To, if you want to really say fuck you to a bunch of conceptual artists, this is a great way to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a quote from you. I feel the strongest when I'm empowered to do something that is complete questionable taste. Yeah, I, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I'm not interested in, um, um, in yeah, of, of that was a liberation. When I arrived in New York, um, I had so much rejection so fast that, um, that it was empowering. You know, so I took jobs as a carpenter, a wood refinisher, metal worker. I painted houses, I did manual labor, and I lived in Williamsburg, and I paid $350 a month for one floor, and I was there with my first wife, and we had $350 a month for the other floor, and we painted in there, and blasted like who's and do, and, and the replacements, and, and the Rolling Stones, top value, volume, and, and painted, and went to punk shows, and went to CBGBs, and we had no money, and we were doing this thing. and, and uh, uh, but I had no acceptance in the art world. But we were like, uh, uh, we were cool enough to go to the bar. Or we weren't club kids, because that was too expensive. Um, but we went to the bars that were cool downtown. I insinuated myself into a recording studio uh, called Harold uh, Dessau, which uh, Julian Schnabel had started. And it was downtown. And you would go there, and there, there, there's Iggy Pop. And, and there's the Beastie Boys and everybody, and, and we had a sort of house band there where I sang, and um, so it was a ridiculous uh, kind of youth. But I was so uh, liberated because I didn't think I would ever make it as a painter. Um, and then, you know, so I was 36 when I finally was discovered by Paul Castle. And, um, and uh, also uh, Irving Blum, who Irving encouraged, Blum was a first, yeah. encouraged you uh, to... Yeah. To yeah, pursue Irving water color. Like, Don't despair! <laughs> you know, the Irving Blum. Shut up, fuck. I'm like a kid, you know? And he's like, uh, uh, how much is this painting? And I, I'd say, oh shit, I get my hopes up. I say, $1,500. So he'd write me a check and put an envelope and hand it to me. And then he'd leave with the painting. I opened the envelope, it'd be for $1,200. Yeah. It's fantastic. And I would go back to Irving. I'd say, oh, you gave yourself $300 discount. He said, Okay, you know, I just let him know, I noticed. <laughs> but I was grateful, because he did, he, kept, he would come every month and buy another one. So after a while, it worked out just fine, yeah. And he gave you confidence, because uh, yeah. Irving Blum was the f one of the very first dealer of uh, Andy Warhol, Liechtenstein, yeah. or Ed Russia, too. Yeah, he would say, I've seen it before, this is what it looks like. People look at you, you know, like this. If you paint like, you're in your masterpiece phase, you know, he'd say all this kind of shit. He, he, and he has a great uh, manner. He does this thing. Um, if you ask me, if you say a statement, even something, just say something about the weather. The sun is really shining. Sun is shining, exactly right. <laughs> That's for Irving Blum. And he does it to everyone, so then you feel like a genius when you're around him, because he's saying, you know, oh wow, you know, the subway's late. The subway's late, exactly right. You know, it doesn't matter what you say, you sound like. And I think he sold a lot of paintings that way. And so the, the, the narrative part is also very important in your work. You discovered Giotto uh, while uh, you were traveling to Italy. Yes. And also at RISD, uh, the Rhode Island School of Design, you've uh, learned cinema. It was, you were a cinema alumni. I was a film major. We, 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 young people often have contempt for what they're good at. They're like, oh, that's easy, you know? And so I, was, I could paint and draw, so I thought, oh, 
painting and drawing, whatever, you know. The real art is cinema, you know. Everybody go, you know, that's the ultimate thing. You cry in the cinema. You don't cry in front of a painting, you know. And so I didn't want to paint, be a painter. I was trying to rebel against that. Again, a way of trying to be cool and fit in. And so I studied film and then went home and painted. And, um, and pretty soon I realized, oh my God, I'm a, pain, I'm a terrible filmmaker and I'm a very, I'm a very good painter. That, I mean, that's what I found out. That's a good thing to learn at art school, what you're good at. When we even met last, last time, you told me that you wanted to be Herzog. Herzog. Yeah, Werner exactly. Herzog. Oh, shit. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I wanted to make a gear of the wrath of God, you know? You know, my own version about Audubon. And I, I have a, another quote uh, from Herzog uh, about Grizzly Man. You, you, you saw the, the movie Grizzly Man. <laughs> of course. It's the story of a, a, uh, an American guy who, who fell in love with bears and during 10 to 13 years set up every summer in the bear's territory. Uh, the documentary ends up very bad. I won't spoil you. But um, anyway, during his journey, he, he met two foxes that he, he makes friends that's with, with true. them. Yeah, that's right. And, I forgot about um, that. At some point, the poor foxes that were following him uh, are killed by the bear. Oh, yeah, I forgot. And, and this poor guy who's really nice and candid and, and sweet, and who is mourning his friend, and at this right point, I won't have the German and the voice of Herzog, but Herzog says, I think it's really uh, applicable to your work, I believe the common denominator of the universe is not harmony, but chaos, hostility, and murder. In front of this poor guy mourning the, yeah, the fox. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is Herzog, right? Yeah. When I look into the bear's <laughs> eyes, yeah. <laughs> and in some ways, you manage to do narrative, but on another medium. So you're kind of Herzog. I, 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 I love that he. We have some overlapping interests, probably. I, I probably. I'm waiting for Benedict Toshin to introduce us. You know, he's. You know, it's a long wait. What the fuck. It's all right. I mean, I don't even know. Maybe he'll, well, you know, often you meet these people and they are a disappointment, so who knows? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, they won't, because they don't love me. I won't, <laughs> you know. <laughs> they have to be in love with me or I'm upset, right? Yeah. Um, another th important thing in cinema is the point of view. And where do you put yeah. the camera? And that's also really important in your work. Where do you pl place the, the, the viewer, that the was, human being? That was a big lesson. I mean, like from, you know, look at Hitchcock, or they ask Scorsese what the most important decision he makes in film, and it was where to put the camera. And so I do that a lot. And when I think about where to put the camera, I'm thinking about uh, the POV, meaning the point of view, the point of view of the, okay, so, like, ah. This is based on a folk tale, so it's a more human point of view, if that makes any sense. Or that is based on the Wizard of Oz. That's a flying monkey from the Wizard of Oz, as if the flying monkey had actually evolved rather than it was a dwarf in costume. I thought, well, what if flying monkeys were actual animals that had evolved in Africa? What would they look like, and how would they behave? And so I made up a whole narrative in my head that Louis B. Merritt tried to get a whole a bunch of flying monkeys to work at the... Uh, to, you know, the director was trying to control them and they're flying all over the set. And so then they say, forget it, we'll just get little people and put them in costume. And, but he kept one. And that's a real flying monkey from Africa, you know, as if it existed as a real thing. So that's the POV of, a, of, a, of Hollywood, in a sense. But then I'll, I'll go directly to the animal itself and think, okay, I want you to see everything through the animal's eyes, you know. So there's a lot of... of of ways to, to approach a human being painting an animal. Are you painting uh, an imaginary animal? Are you painting an actual animal? Are you painting from the animal's point of view? Or are you painting from the culture's point of view? The cliches we have about the animal. Are we embracing those or rejecting those? And there's a lot of things you can think about in this project, you know? So, like this painting, Virginia Woolf went out on her birthday and she was walking in the downs and she saw a fox running in the rain 
and then she saw one barking in the sun, and I thought about her mental illness and how this is like, so then I thought, I'm painting a painting about foxes that Virginia Woolf saw on her birthday to do a portrayal of what it feels like to have the kind of mental illness that she had. So somebody even said, oh, I thought the running in the rain one, the, the animal would seem desperate. And I said, well, no, when you're depressed, when you're deeply depressed, sometimes you go very inward, and you also maybe are even going to seek help. Like that might be the bottom that gets you help finally. And then the manic upswing stage is almost the scarier one. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, things are great, you know, and then, oh shit, you know, this is going to come crashing down. So I was really, and then someone pointed out, you put Van Gogh in the grass, um, <laughs> which I didn't even know I was doing, but all the turmoil in the grass turned out to be like her mental turmoil. And the, the, soon after this, just over that hill, this is the actual place where she saw these foxes, and just over the hill is where she drowned herself. So this painting becomes like a journal entry of Virginia Woolf's. And so this is where the frustration comes because sometimes people need, well, everyone needs to sum up what the work is about. So they'll say, oh, he deals with uh, environmental issues. And I'm like, there's nothing, there's too many foxes in England. Like, it has nothing to do with the environment. It, it has to do with the mental health of a, of a, a genius and, and, and her connection with this animal and her noticing the animal and saying, it's a very rare sight. And so I named the whole show after this journal entry of Virginia Woolf's. And, um, and I wrote her journal entry on the top of the piece. And then I, I used a Renaissance trope to show uh, the day unfolds, so it starts in the rain and then it clears up and it also does it left to right just like you write on a piece of paper, so it's literary. So I'm thinking about all of these things when I make these pictures and, um, and it was really funny because when I started making them, people are like, oh, he just he illustrates animal things, you know, and I'm like, well, that's fine, but it, it, it's a complicated project. I, I, I'm trying to bring more to it than just that. Uh, and, and whether people can see it or not doesn't really matter, but it keeps me interested. And I don't know where they'll lead. I read, a par I read this phrase, and I was so excited when I read, Virginia Woolf on her birthday seeing two foxes. I know I have a painting. <laughs> uh, you know, done. It's already done, yeah. But scale was also one of your, your challenge because you were very skilled to do little sketches, but you wanted to do more also, that's why and how you started to do big Aud pieces also. Audubon made life-size animals in his elephant folio, and when I saw one as a child, I thought, oh my God, it's like having the bird, some of the birds in the elephant folio are extinct. So you have an ivory bill woodpecker, life-size on the page, and I'm like, it's like having it in the room. It's fantastic, because every feather is perfect. So I'm like, I need to do this. There's a life-size lion. Those are life-size foxes. They're in the room with you. This thing is about to jump right out of the frame, you know? I want that feeling that you get when you're at the zoo, and it's like, oh, shit, those are bigger than I thought they were, or smaller, you know, or weirder. And you're doing it with watercolor, which is a very old practice, and unforgiving, too, for... It's unforgiving, but also it's like Durer painted the hair. Uh, first great natural history watercolor in the world, and then everybody's been trying to do that ever since. You know, Audubon, me, anyone. It's like, that's the best. And nobody's come close to making something like the Durer hair ever again. I saw it in real life, and um, hell yeah. <laughs> that's how art is supposed to look, in my opinion. And so you, you've quote uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, because you read a lot, uh, you read a lot of explorers' books. But uh, how, what's the chicken in the, and the egg? You, you have a theme sometimes, like the Bête du Gévaudan in the Musée de la Chasse uh, yes. last time, around which you you dig, you, re, you make your research, I guess. Yeah. But for a, 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 an exhibition like this one, how, how do you find your uh, your ideas? Well, I was reading uh, 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 the making of the Wizard of Oz which is just uh, entertaining me. And then, this, then it occurred to me I had 
the flying monkeys. Of course I have to paint those. They terrified me as a little kid. You see this movie, The Flying Monkey is the scariest fucking thing in the world. And then I thought, but if a real flying monkey existed, it wouldn't be so scary. It would just be a monkey. He's going about his monkey business. He's not, he's not, he doesn't work for a witch. He wants to be left alone. And then I made up the whole narrative, and I swear, I kind of, now this is going to mess up the film, but I want to get up and read this thing. What do I do? Don't, <laughs> don't do it, right? Are you saying don't do it? But I wrote on the piece. I'm going to read it. But this is really good. I've been... I've been, okay, I made the voice of a guy who was an animal trainer in, in Hollywood in 1938. So I'm reading this book and I say, I've been training performing animals since vaudeville days, so when The Wizard of Oz was in the works, I got the call. Fleming was determined to use real flying monkeys from the Congo. That was MGM in those days, never cutting corners. But even Treflick in New York uh, was only able to find about a dozen animals. Very rare, these monkeys, even then. And the script called for an army, hundreds. So anyway, um, right away things got balled up. Anyhow, I happen to like flying monkeys. They're smart and quite gentle. But nobody, I mean nobody, can train a dozen to fly in formation. I had two days to work with them before the first scene. It was bedlam. Right off, they just flew all over the set like pigeons, landing on the equipment and pulling the place apart. Of course, after that, Fleming used little people in monkey costumes, and I got the breeze after four thankless days. No screen credit, naturally. I remember hearing that Louis B. Mayer kept the best-looking monkey, the original Nico, I guess. In any case, I was on to the next thing by then, over in Cayunga with Louis Weiss helping to set up Monkey Island. Another wacky story for another day. So that's my fake animal trainer. And I wrote it right on the piece. So I just thought, what would happen if you had real flying monkeys, you know? Might as well. I, sorry for the chaos. I did the flying monkey thing. Maybe we could just jump to the questions of the public. Yes. Does anyone have any questions? Is it brave enough to do that? Raise a hand and be like. Who are you inspired by? Who am I inspired by? So, so it started with the Audubon project, you know, like I was interested in, in all these natural history artists that were working in the 19th century. So they're traveling all over the place, you know, they're going to Africa and this and that. So it's not just him. So it starts with Audubon and then, as he mentioned before, there was an artist at the Museum of Natural History called Carl Akeley and he, he created those dioramas and those were tremendous inspiration to me. Um, I'm kind of trying to make that like a life, you know, like a feeling of a diorama, a very fine diorama. Um, and uh, the Renaissance, I learned, I studied Giotto and all of those kinds of Trecento painters and drew all of that when I was a student. I didn't know what I would do with it, but I realized, like yesterday, I went to the Louvre and looked at the Veronese wedding at Cana. And you just study the way he puts the figures together, how they interact, how it all interlocks, and, and how they communicate with each other, because I make a lot of group pictures as well of animals. And then I just apply the principles of these are... So I'm not interested, I like put it in coming up with any kind of new language, visual language. I don't have that I like a contemporary artist. I, I'm making paintings that they uh, traditionally they are the same as they've always been made but the narratives are very different than anything that's been made before so that's how it is contemporary because I have a different story to tell with the very old techniques and very so the inspiration comes from the Renaissance and the 19th century and things like this you know and then as he was saying pop culture stuff because you want an edgy thing and you want a sense of humor in them you know the flying monkey picture is funny, in my opinion, you know. Yeah, I think they're better when they're slightly amusing, actually, than if they're grim, you know. But I make grim ones, too. <laughs> While people are thinking about their question, I have another one, okay. if you don't mind, as a, as a follow-up. Since we're here. Another, another, another Herzog uh, quote. What would an ocean be without a monster lurking in the dark? It would be like sleep without dreams. Last time we've met, I asked you about your dream project. 
and you told me that you wanted to paint the sea and all the monsters behind it. Is it still something that you have in mind? I do want to paint a life-size whale, yeah. Like a hundred foot painting of a whale in watercolor and see what that's like to do. It would have to be a, like a jigsaw puzzle. It would have to be made of separate pieces and it would fit all together, but I have a project now that I, I had to wait because what's his face? Ron Howard made a bad movie about this event that I was interested in. I'm glad I said that in, online and everything. But <laughs> it wasn't the first time he's done that. And, um, and it was about, about the, uh, this whale, a sperm whale that attacked a ship in the 19th century and sunk it, a whale ship. And he deliberately sunk the ship. He hit it three times and sunk it. And the survivors were in the ocean for like 90 days. So I want to show this whale hitting this boat and then make 90 images that show the deterioration of the, of the people on the, on the, you know, floating in the ocean. So they're thinking about food and, and they're cannibalizing each other and that is, is worked into each of the 90 panels, but overall you see the whale. So this would be, it would take like a, two years to paint, so you have to get like Max or Larry to find a big client, you know, <laughs> that's willing to pay me for a couple of years, you know. And I'll paint them a fucking whale and then they'll have a whale. I mean, that's pretty good. You know, but it's going to cost some dough. And how, how big will it be compared to Nyla, the, the elephant? It's going to be 100 feet long. The whale is 80 feet long that attacked the boat, at least. So the painting has to be at least 100 feet long and maybe 20 feet high. So it'd be bigger than the wedding painting that I saw yesterday at the Louvre, which is the biggest painting in the Louvre. So it's a big painting. A lot of it is just going to be gray. <laughs> A big ass whale. Yeah, whatever. He's underwater. It'll be a very big blue picture. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Does anyone have a question, maybe? I don't know. Everything is a. It takes anyone courage to raise your hand. What? Oh. You want me to talk about one of the paintings? Is that really. It? Okay, okay. No, I'm just worried that people want to go eat story. or something like yeah. that or drink. <laughs> but the painting, okay, the painting uh, behind me is, a, is there was a, it, the Panchatantra, which is a, a Indian fables. And um, the, there was three uh, very learned Brahmins, and they, they said they found a skeleton in the woods, and they didn't know what it was. And so they, they said, let's, let's show our learning, and we'll bring this animal back to life. And so they, they say, well, I can reassemble the skeleton, says the first one, and he puts the skeleton together. The next one says, I can put flesh and, and, and bones on it and everything. And they, they put flesh and bones. And then their, their uneducated servant says, oh my God, it's a lion. And he climbs a tree. So I did him running away. And then the last learned guy says, I'll bring it to life. And he brings it to life. And of course, it eats all the wise men. And then the the unlearned man climbs down and is fine, leaves after the whole thing's over. So this is the moment when the lion comes to life to eat them. And I did monsoon because it's when India is reborn anyway, a rebirth image like the lion comes back to life after being rained on. And then the lightning, which is from like uh, Frankenstein, brings the animal back to life. So references and, and the uh, 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 marigold garland here and the three wise men animating the skeleton. And then I put the Kajuraho temples in, in there because I like or, uh, tantric art. <laughs> I've thrown a little sex in there. And um, that's about it. Yeah, that's the painting. Yeah. So, so it's almost an illustration. Um, but I put these, you know, I put layers in. Um, thank you so much, everybody, well, for coming so to much. this thing. How wonderful. Wow. <sighs> Can I take this thing off? Because I'll start talking to people and then it won't, it will, who knows what I'll say. <laughs> <The mic. laughs>